Hey guys, what's up? Aru. You know, the possibility that the Foxian race have either Hashirama cells or nano machines in their genes really explain Tengyin's ability to taunt every mob. Welcome to another video of someone who can't fix that. This video is gonna go over as much of 1.2's Trailblaze quest as I can, the different scenes and what they mean, and what it may entail for the future. As usual, timestamps below. Let's get started. The main story continues on from Dan Shu betraying us and the disciples of the Sanctus Medicus commencing their move on the Alliance, or at least the Lawfu. After defeating the Ebon Deer and saving the Artisanship Commission, we make our way to the Alchemy Commission, as introduced by Jing Yuan. The Alchemy Commission is linked to a harbor that leads you to the Scale Gorge Waterscape where you'll need to seal the Ambrosial Arbor. And the disciples of the Sanctus Medicus were said to be among the members of the Alchemy Commission. Understandable, since they could easily study and access the tree from there and prepare their defenses even before their assault starts. Something interesting about the Lo Fu was that in the Wars before, they lost half of their delves, which is these areas over here, to an emanator of abundance. This emanator, I think, is from a race called the Wing Weavers, the same race that enticed the Alliance to look for the elixir of immortality, and are the main branch of the denizens of abundance, which, if you didn't already know, are the various races that follow Yaoshi. The Wing Weavers' planet of Moldrasil was also a huge tree, and they were said to be barbarians that pillaged and took in slaves to maintain their planet that saps the life out of other planets for survival. Their wing perer, or emperor of the wing weavers are considered emanators of abundance. It's also stated that they almost wiped out the Lo Fu up until Lan's arrow split the Ambrosial Arbor. There's also speculations of the relation between the Ambrosial Arbor and Boldrasil, which are both trees. There's a legion called the Peacock Angel that the Alliance keeps watch of, and there are also Cycranes gaining a form of sentience, as well as achievements highlighting the seven deadly sins. It makes it seem like the abundance is watching us instead, don't you think? The new enemy mobs we fight are also related to the Arbor, since they are war beasts created by the Alliance when they still worshipped Yaoshi. Kushuan later explains the situation as well as the plan to beat the disciples. She also gives us information on how long life affects one's capacity for memories and how it is related to long life species' emotional threshold, specifically immortal humans, because other races can die or rebirth in some way. And immortal humans, without the admonitions of land, they're all doomed to become Marastruck at some point, just like Genshin Impact's erosion principle. But we're talking about Star Rail, so I'll stop talking about Genshin. To my understanding, short-life species that live for less than 100 years can be affected by the blessing and or curse of Yaoshi. And only the immortal humans, the Foxians who live for about 450 years, the Vidyadara who live for 700 years, as well as the other denizens of abundance are affected. Essentially, any long-life species can be affected with Mara, which is induced by Yaoshi's blessing only. Other races have a hard reset or a full stop and that they die or rebirth with with no memories. The trailblazers were not affected by the crucible mists because we, although human, did not take the blessing of Yaoshi, which makes humans immortal. Except for maybe the MC, which is a special case. Pushwan then points out there are a bunch of crucibles that endlessly puff out smoke or mist. These are elixir crucibles that alchemists used to perform the way of immortality back then. A past echo says it was created by the Vidyadara that takes water from the sea of Vidyadara and creates medicinal pellets. Pushwan says that the crucibles absorb the arbor's power and created the smoke that never stops. The Eve Mist Mansion is named that way because of the endless mist that it exudes and is rather was, responsible for the immortality given to the humans of the Alliance. Only this time, the crucibles were spiked with pellets that elicit Mara instead of the usual immortality. The same pellets we, the MC, might have also ingested. Whether or not we can be afflicted with Mara or that we as the MC are immortal, I honestly can't say, but we may or may not be able to get Yaoshi's gaze at some point in the story. And that might be one of the factors. There's a line between life and death, 
and the disciples of the Sanctus Medicus want to sit on that line and become so-called Celestials. This power, this ascended form, allowed them to mold themselves and others around them in any way they want, much like the many denizens of abundance. The shape-shifting Borzin, the shapeless Heliobi, and of course the wing weavers, as well as the other denizens. Pantelia is an emanator of destruction, the Lord Ravager serving Nanook, the Aeon of destruction. Right now, we know that there are seven Lord Ravagers called the Seven Extremes. The names of all the Ravagers we still don't know, but we do have information on their characteristics and affinity. We have first and foremost Zephyro, the Scorching Flame, who destroys at will. He emphasizes the beauty and violence, as well as passion for destruction, hence his very explosive form of destroying planets and galaxies. Next, we have Selenova, which is the first line general. She seems like a very rational Lord Ravager. And by rational, I mean that she made peace treaties with the Shanzo for the sake of defeating the Wing Weavers. Third is Iron Tomb, who uses technological destruction that destroys all forms of networks, technology, communication, and oftentimes goads the planet and calling it the failure of knowledge. Fantilia, who creates a structural collapse and destroys the civilization very slow and methodically. The Shanzo records say that it feels like a slow crawl of an ant colony and that they were facing against a chess grandmaster. The fifth one is the Unseen Ravager, who uses spiritual disintegration and he most likely uses religion against the civilization of a planet where people lose all belief and realize that their fall will be inevitable. Sixth is the Star Devourer who extinguished stars in galaxies. Within these extinguished stars, you could find the Antimatter Legion waiting and attacking any who enter this dark space. Finally, the unnamed Lord. This Lord Ravager was said to have converted an entire planet into the Antimatter Legion and was mentioned to be imploding the entire planet into conversion. As for what strategies they might use, we still don't know. Scale Gorge Waterscape is an oceanic region of the Vidyadaras planet. This was given to the Alliance by the Scions in helping to seal the arbor, and is where the main seal of the arbor is located. Even though Lan split the tree in two, the arbor, as a blessing of abundance, never really died and was just there. Kind of alive, but also kind of dead, somewhere in between. The echoes of the past to me seem like a phenomena that happened to specific Vidyadara. Even though other people can see similar echoes in Scale Gorge Waterscape, I'm sure they won't see Dan Hung's echoes manifesting. The ones Dan Hung first sees are his echoes before he left Lofu as a kid, and he's apparently the incarnation of Long. That is to say, he basically looks like Dan Feng or Dan Feng. Would that mean that he is an Aeon or an Emanator? But I digress. The fact that these voices of the past aren't exclusive to Vidyadaras means that we can find more instances of these from other races, unless this is only specific to the Lofu. The battle between Dan Hung, Blade, and Yang Qing, plus the sort of agreement with Jing Yuan and the Hunters, the characters in this meeting I'd say are related to the echoes of the past in Scale Gorge Waterscape. Blade's ideal of life and death from his story dialogue and in his gameplay dialogue makes me think he knows quite a lot about the past. Yang Cheng's ice abilities point towards Jing Liu. To my unfortunate weeb fate, I forgot to turn the audio to English to at least help me discern the voices. But the Echoes of the past seem to entail the same loose events that Dan Feng, Blade, Jing Yuan, Yang Qing, and Jing Liu speak of. So I'm betting on one or more of these echoes being from any of these characters, maybe their past or maybe their ancestors. Yu Wei Yan being possibly Jing Liu, and Ying Qing being either Jing Yuan's ancestor or Blade. Next is Kafka's ability to make people quote-unquote listen to her, which we've seen already happen in the opening sequence of the game, as well as her eyes again changing to a different design. This, I think, is how she's able to speak and command certain individuals. She can use her spirit whisper at grabbing hold of your psyche. This ability is still a mystery and we don't know how or why she can do such a thing. We don't even know which planet she comes from or if she even has an Aeon that she 
follows. And not to mention, a sort of specialty of each members of the hunters to kind of bypass certain problems in regards to life, death, reality, and fate. Next is Dan Hung meeting the Express again and deciding to help seal the arbor or not. This to me is the charm of Star Rail's narrative and world story. We can essentially experience other worlds and characters' perspectives through their own eyes. And not to mention we can speak to ourselves, the MC. This is something we see from Honkai Impact 3rd as well. And seeing their opinions through the eyes of their own friends makes the game even more alive. Now the Express is greatly highlighted in this scene as well. Freedom of choice that each member has is paramount to the Express's philosophy. It's also the reason why members of the Express are only a handful. The perilous journey and trials that they face isn't for the faint of heart. To lose a member of the Express is basically to lose a family member. Which is why each member has to choose of their own volition if they wish to continue to trailblaze or not. This moves us into the successive generations of High Elders. There were many generations of High Elders since Dan Feng's first sealing of the Arbor. The latest generation of High Elder who appeared as a child isn't powerful enough to keep the Arbor at bay and isn't able to dream, which is apparent in the current High Elder, Bailu. Passing down the title of Imbibitor Lune is still in wait until her coming of age ceremony. Dan Hung could experience all of this and he is a criminal of the law. Fu, which leads us to Dan Feng's flawed exuviation charm and the only High Elder to have enough power to keep watch of the Ambrosial Arbor. Bailu and the past Elders, to my understanding, were not as powerful because of this flawed charm to keep Dan Feng's consciousness and incarnation alive. If the senior Vidyadara didn't go through with this flawed exuviation or molting of the skin, which is quite um, morbid, then we might not be able to seal the arbor at all or be able to even meet Dan Hung in the first place. I don't know what the exuviation process actually is, but if Dan Hung had to run away and exile himself, then the molting process or exuviation would mean to erase or basically execute a Vidyadora's life and rebirth cycle. Finally, what Fantilia has done means a lot to what Ravagers and by extension every Emanator or maybe even every Aeon could do. She basically took the blessing of the Arbor and made an abomination of both destruction and abundance. She also states that she would take the blessing of abundance and bring Shanzo's destruction with it. Remember what I said about Shipei and Enna in my Shipei video? Yeah, Shipei might have taken Enna's power and the Abundance might have also taken Tazeron's power after becoming a swarm which was possibly after Tazeron defeated and divided Long the Permanence. Which is also told in the Vidyadara's lore once they lost their power and the ocean creatures began to become toxic and the sea beasts multiplied and the Vidyadara lost their power derived from Long. To my understanding, Aeon can change the course of the universe after killing another Aeon. This speaks volumes when you consider what would happen if the hunt kills the Abundance and what would happen to the Alliance. But that's for another video. For now, Aeons killing Aeons and taking powers from them are confirmed. But it also might confirm that if the Shanzo kills the Aeon who blessed them with immortality, they might just straight up die because of how long they lived with Yao Shi's blessing. That's it for this Star Rail lore recap-ish video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Comment and share your thoughts on the current version of Star Rail. And if you did, hit the like button and subscribe and hit the bell for more videos like these. Star Rail's lore is a real headache since the world is so big and I don't really know how to put details together without taking too much time. So hopefully this kind of summary slash recap lore video every patch would be better. Anyway, that's it for now. I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, comment, and subscribe for more ramblings and stay mad theorists. Bye!